Hey everybody, and welcome to the beginning of Unit 4. We're going to talk nutrition interventions. All right, so you know we have done the assessment, we have estimated needs, we've talked about specific conditions that are, uh, well, let's say specific to geriatrics, but they're very common in geriatrics. Now we're going to talk about diagnosing, nutrition diagnosis, and interventions, and building an entire care plan for your elder patient. So right now we're talking interventions. We could go either way with this. Honestly, if you'd like to go to the, first, the next one first and then come back, this, this is the two parts of the same thing. So yeah, either way, we're talking interventions to, this time. So what we're looking at or what specifically works in the geriatric population, especially in terms of a facility environment or a congregate meal system environment. So what does work? Diet liberalization, increased frequency, the team approach, creating a pleasant environment, empowering elders, ass um, assessment counseling, and by that I mean nutrition counseling for the assessment, we'll get into that, and exercise. Diet liberalization, probably the most important thing out of all of this is diet liberalization, uh, which is just you know the relaxation of a therapeutic diet prescription. I would argue that many times diet, actually I would argue every, in every situation diet liberalization should be compared to some point, to some degree. I, I want to put as few restrictions on somebody as possible. It's very, very tempting as somebody with a lot of knowledge like you have and a lot of desire to help to throw a bunch of things at people. But remember that the most important nutrition prescription you can give. The most important therapy uh, schedule any therapist, and I do lump dietitians into the group of any therapist, that anyone can do is the therapy that the person will do. Okay, That's what I tell people all the time when I'm with clients, when they ask what's the best diet, what's the best exercise program, uh, what kind of, what's the best nutrition pick a thing, you know, they're happy with the Mediterranean diet, are they wanting to do the DASH diet? No, nobody wants to do the DASH diet, it's not sexy. But my point is always the same thing. What will you do? What will you be comfortable with? Because it doesn't matter how great your interventions are if they're not going to do it, right? So the whole point of diet liberalization is, one, to make sure that they will do it as much as possible, and also to increase uh, quality of life and diet satisfaction. So our goal here is to enforce as few restrictions as possible, except for consistency, maybe. And there's a maybe to that. The reason for this is, I said earlier, because they won't do it otherwise. And if, you won't, if somebody won't cooperate with you, it doesn't matter how great your plan was. But also specifically within terms of elder population, more restrictions have been shown to equate to patients that eat less, just across the board. And uh, greater meal enjoyment has been associated with greater intake. And those two things are not separate, right? The reason you have fewer, uh, less intake for more restrictions is because they're not enjoying themselves as much. Greater meal enjoyment equals greater intake. And this is a, this, I don't feel like I can understate this. When asked by, um, when uh, elders and their families were asked, what is the most important uh quality of life indicator for you, 97% of them said food. So almost 100% of them consider food to be the most important quality of life indicator. So if you can increase the, um, the, the satisfaction of meals, how much they enjoy their meals, you are doing a holistic improvement to their lives. So we want as few restrictions as we can possibly get away with to improve their quality of life. Remember also that you want to consider Owen's triage dictum. Uh, what is the most important? What's the most important outcome? What's the most severe potential outcome? Now, I'll actually say I think that other care providers struggle with this more than dietitians do, but every keep it in mind all the time. Consider the long-term effects of what you're suggesting. If you have a non-adherent diabetic patient, and your other option is if you force them to go on a strict diabetic diet, you know they're just not going to eat, they're going to be miserable. 
what's going to do more harm in the long run? Is it going to be that increased carbohydrate intake or is it going to be that decreased intake? The academy stance is that intake should be prioritized, and I would agree with that. If you know they're not going to eat, or if you see that someone is not eating, the first thing to consider is, can we loosen this diet somewhat? Are there places we could liberalize? Another very common intervention, and common because it works, is uh, increased frequency. Offer more food more often. Um, and this comes in a couple of forms. One is that uh, you can offer more frequent, smaller meals throughout the day. Uh, this works in part because um, the, this generation, uh, that elders that we currently have, this, this will probably stop in a little while. Uh, people will age out of this program, if you will. Uh, that they are from the generation of people that are, were told to eat everything. They're, nothing went to waste. They were on, they came from rationing and restriction when they were young, and they're uncomfortable with leaving things on the plate. And sometimes that manifests as if you pre present them with a what looks like a large plate of food to them, instead of trying to eat it and then feeling bad about how they didn't eat it, they'll just choose not to engage at all. And, you know, that kind of does make sense if you can say, you, I don't want to be responsible for this waste. I am not even going to involve myself with the program. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, the other thing that is very, very true is that more food offered equals more acceptance. And we don't really understand why that's the case. The two kind of ongoing or the current best hypotheses are that either it's a brute numbers game. And if you're working with a patient that takes 50% of food all the time, that if you offer six times a day instead of three times a day, you are just by default increasing their intake by twice as much. Maybe, you know, if you're at six times instead of three and they're always going to take half, maybe. Uh, the other suggestion has been, and this sounds terrible to say when I describe it, it's going to be kind of like, you know, maybe if I ask you enough times if you'd like some peanut butter crackers, Eventually, you get to the point where you're like, you know what? I will take the damn peanut butter crackers if you will leave me alone. Maybe? Yeah, we, we don't know. Um, either way, though, it has been shown to work. Most success does occur in the AM for most people. That's frequently where the most successful interventions happen. You will often see in any kind of facility environment that interventions are front-loaded in the AM, and then they, you know, their effectiveness seems to taper off over time throughout the day. That's not 100% true. Maybe you have a person who's just a real night owl and doesn't want to get up at 8 o'clock in the morning for breakfast, but most of the time, the AM intervention works better. All right, variety. 74% um, remember of uh, elders' diets need modification. Many of them do not get enough micronutrients especially or protein because they don't have mo uh, various protein sources. So what you want to do, remember we're empowering that's the most important thing. We're empowering. So you don't want to give them food. You don't want to like just put it out in front of them as a weird weird food they've never seen before. You want to offer it. You want to suggest it. We have this available. Would you like to try it? Sometimes, especially with strange foods, and remember again that there are various reasons this is the case. Some of it is um, just exposure. They've never seen this kind of food, and as you get older... Uh, often seems that your interest in experimenting with new foods kind of decreases. It might be socioeconomic. They've never had this food given to them before, but had an opportunity to get it. It might be physical. Maybe they just can't have been able to chew it. They can't, didn't have a way to, you know, to prepare it, or they lack knowledge in how to prepare it. All of these things are possible. Uh, so you just want to offer it, make it available. If especially, again, if you're in a facility or a congregate kind of situation, you're like, I, we're, we're doing the hard part. We, we're going to cook it. We just would like you to try it. Um, sometimes also what works really well in a situation with strange foods and variety is uh, eat with the residents. Our facilities have a program in which the staff eats with the residents in the dining room. And that kind of models the behavior of what this is. You know, what is this weird thing you have put in front of me? What do I do with it? 
you look over there and you can see what they're doing with it. You're like, oh, I got it. You also want to change options regularly. Don't. One of the things that happens, you know, we'll talk about this as we go through this lecture. It's very, very tempting to find something that works and then just keep hitting that because it works. But you don't want to do that. You want to change things up a lot. You want to change things, uh, options regularly. And you want to offer multiple meals and snacks of different things. Again, partially this is for the nutrient variety. Partially this is for quality of life. Uh, this one sounds kind of silly, I'll admit. But it is something to keep in mind. A team approach is very beneficial, especially when working with elder patients. It's, it's, it's important for everybody. There's a reason why there's not just one person who's responsible for a group in any situation. Uh, but it's very, very important in case of uh, elderly patients. You want a multi multidisciplinary approach to um, encourage people from multiple angles, if you will. Um, yes, you are the expert on malnutrition. And you want to provide education on malnutrition and counseling on malnutrition. But everybody else needs to be involved too. We want a lot of encouragement and a lot of affirmation all over the place. What that also means is that you are also the wound person. You are also the therapist or the life coach or the uh, exercise therapist. We're all involved. So while other people are encouraging them to eat, you're also encouraging them to go to therapy. You're also encouraging them to take their medication. You're also involved in wound checks. And the reason for this is just because you'll, as you develop kind of a bond with patients within whatever program we're talking about here, if you've ever been involved in therapy of any kind of sort, where, you're, where it's a, some, a disease that you're having to deal with or an injury or something, therapy sucks. It sucks a lot, and it takes a lot of energy and a lot of willpower to do. And it's very helpful to have a, a bunch of people who are providing you with support and affirmation and positivity. And that's why, honestly, the, the multidisciplinary approach works. It's because it's that group of people offering support and affirmation. And maybe you're their favorite. And maybe you can encourage them a little bit to try some new things. That, that's why it's for, what it's for. It's not just one person coming to nag this person about stuff. It's everybody saying, how was breakfast? Did you get to get a chance to go to therapy today? How are your feet doing? Everybody's involved. Okay, um, also education. There is, for reasons I don't understand, a kind of a vibe in among people in long-term care that elders do not like education and they cannot be educated. I don't know where that came from. It's not true. <laughs> it's not true. Uh, now, the way you approach it is different. When you're working with a younger patient, a lot of times your goal is to kind of get buy-in from them because of how much better their life is going to be. You want to try new fruits and vegetables because they're tasty and look how pretty they look and you're going to, you know, it's going to make you so much healthier. Going to give you, a, but, but yeah, I kind of sorry, I kind of blanked there on what I was trying to say. But generally, you're trying to get some buy-in from an improved quality of life, or at the very least, you're trying to encourage them that it's not going to make things less pleasant, right? And that's not the approach you generally need to take with an elder patient. So geriatric patients will respond to education if it's tailored to what they're interested in. The first thing is that they want an intrapersonal, casual approach. They do not want to be lectured to, uh, which I, I think is fair for most of us. None of us want to be lectured on how bad we're doing on something. We want to be, you know, this, this approach here, though, is I, as your friend and someone who I'm concerned about you, want to talk to you about this. The other thing that you need to do with elder patients, and to be fair, this may be a generational thing, and again, these these particular people may be aging out of the system, but generally they want to focus on practical benefits. They want to know what they need to do and why it's going to work for them. So as opposed to kind of, I think, what people often think, which is that you don't want to get into their personal business. Uh, let's, let's pick something that comes up a lot. 
uh, they're constipated. They're uncomfortable because they're constipated. They don't want to be anymore. So you don't want to go in there and start making a sales pitch on how the benefits of... Oh, let's back up. So what do you recommend for somebody with constipation? Fruits and vegetables, fiber, increased fluid, exercise. And all of these are good. All of those are good and validated interventions. You would normally try to convince, as I said earlier, a person who is a younger patient that this is not going to suck too bad, honestly. What you want to do with an older patient is they want to know if it's going to work or not. They don't care about the benefits of like, of quality of life improvement for eating more fruits and vegetables and how tasty they are. They want to know, is it going to help them poop? And if it is, tell them that. That's what they want to know. And that's all they care about. And I promise you, if you've not worked with elders before, they are not shy about sharing this information with you. So don't feel weird about doing it. They will open up to you on this. No problem. So focus on what the point of this is. Why do I think this is a good intervention for you? Uh, good. Create a pleasant environment. Again, we're talking mostly facilities and congregants here. Um, but it's wild to me how very rarely people do this. But, and I mean, you know, again, facilities and such. Um, the first easiest change to make is contrasting color dishes. Many facilities go with a kind of an off-white beigey color. I think because one, it's pretty common. Two, because it's cheap. And if you're running a facility or a congregate, especially a meal congregate, you don't got cash to burn. So you're looking for the <laughs> the easiest kind of plates to get that are the cheapest to maintain. Um, but also, it's it's kind of common. I'll bet if you go to your cabinet right now and pull out a dinner plate, it's probably going to be some sort of off-white color with some design on it. Like maybe you wear, you have Fiesta wear at your house and they're all bright blue. I, I don't know. But most people don't have that. But if you consider what we're... What we're like at one, it makes it very a more colorful fun environment also if you're working with somebody who either has dementia and cognitive issues or visual impairment we are talking about something like say let me, let me go for the worst case scenario here it's steamed cauliflower and mashed potatoes and a grilled pork chop on a off-white plate and yeah that sounds like a terrible meal i would never have that on my menu but you know worst case scenario so you have off-white, off-white, and off-white on an off-white plate. Makes it very hard to tell what's going on. So make a bright colored plate. If you can get bright colored plates, you know, they provide a stark contrast to the food so that it's easier for somebody to see what they're eating and to tell what's going on. Um, there are also dining room interventions is how I call this, which is, you know, does it, how does the place smell? Um, does it smell like urine? And honestly, side note, if you're in a facility that smells like urine, I would, I would, call, I would um, encourage you to look for new avenues. I, I would not stick with a building that has a smell like that. That's just bad road. Um, anyway, back to what we're talking about. Also, does it, does it smell like cleanser? Does it smell like antiseptic? Um, and those are real, especially in the last few years. You know, we we've, we've just been through a lot, and sanitation is important. But does it smell like it now? It does Or does it smell like, can you smell the food from the kitchen? Um, I've worked in places where they will bake bread, not with the intention of, you know, and obviously they eat it, but the point is to get that smell out there. Or they're always brewing coffee. Things that smell really pleasant and kitchen-y. They're putting them out there on purpose. Uh, can you smell lunch being cooked? You know, things like that. What are there cues in the environment that remind people to eat? What is what are the sounds in there? Um, and remember, we want to tailor the environment to what your resident needs. It's common right now for people to want to turn on a radio or like stream some music or to turn on the TV for the residents because that's what we do. A lot of us do that at home, but they didn't. And you need to keep that in mind when dealing when working with uh, this age group. Is they didn't do that very often. It was still more common to have a meal with the family, sit down at the table. 
Also, another point here, remember we're working with people that may have some cognitive impairment. Think about when, um, okay, think about when you're driving somewhere. If you've ever been driving in like a large city that you've never been to before and you're trying to find the freaking exit and you turn down, maybe you pause the podcast or turn down the radio in your car, you ask the person sitting next to you to help you keep an eye out and please shut up. Maybe if you travel with people, like you ask, you tell the kids in the back to tone it down because we only have so much ability to focus. We only, it's kind of like a finite resource. And if we need to put all of our focus into one thing, we stop paying attention to other things around us. We need to eliminate as much distraction as possible. Same thing here. We want to eliminate as much distractions as possible so that they can focus on what they're doing. And finally, it's company. Um, if you compare when you've eaten by yourself to when you eat with somebody else, usually when you're eating with somebody else, it's a much more pleasant uh, interaction. It's if you're if you're eating by yourself, you're either eating because you're hungry or you're eating because I don't know the, the cookies in the fridge just sounded really good and you decide to get some. So it, it's kind of just a survival thing of some sort or the other. If you're eating with somebody. Now you have an interaction with another human being. It's pleasant, it, hopefully at least. And uh, it's been shown more than once that people tend to eat more when they're eating with somebody else. Again, the whole point of this is to increase, you know, maximize the time that they're there so that it's a pleasant experience, they enjoy it, but also they're eating enough. So having some good company, if you can pair up residents, obviously they sit where they want to sit, but if you can kind of lead people to sit in a specific area, uh, it will help quite a bit. All of these, just these few things you know, of adapting the eating environment have been shown to increase calorie intake by about 181 calories a day, which kind of sounds small, I think, by itself. But remember that our standard of measurement for elder care is 2,000 calories. Um, actually, that's our standard for the, you know, the nutrition recommendations are set at 2,000 calories. So we're talking about a, uh, almost a 10% increase here. And if you think about elder care, even though we still use that 2,000 calories because we're told to, um, most, most older patients don't need 2,000 calories. If we have somebody who needs 1,500 a day, that's a lot. That's a ton. It's like 15% more of what they're getting or what they need to have for the day just from making these tiny, tiny changes. So I, I never want to undersell how um, making the environment more pleasant can help. There's also a, um, making these changes has been shown to decrease assessed dehydration from 3% to 1%. So we're talking a 66% reduction in dehydration just by making these changes. So again, these are very easy, very, you know, fairly simple. And always something to consider if you are be if you are the dietitian in a situation like this. Okay, so empower elders, it's got its own thing. A lot of this has been geared toward empower elders, but it does have its own its own uh, bullet point, I guess. Um, so we want to encourage menu decision making and experimentation as much as possible. And for this, I would encourage you. I know most of you have done at least some work in counseling somebody, whether it was actually doing so or if it was as a practice. And you know how difficult it is to actually get buy-in for something and how important it is to get this person that you're working with to take ownership of meal choices. And that's what we're doing here. We want them to have ownership and buy-in of their meal choices. And think about it from another standpoint as well. If you were in a facility and somebody came by and said, yo, this is what we're having for lunch. I'll bring you some. How much do you like that? Just kind of think about that. How much do you like that when someone tells you that? Probably not much. Maybe you don't care for a little bit. After a while, it's going to grate on you. And so what we want to do is as much as possible, say these are the options open to you. This is what's for lunch today, but we also have these choices if you would like that instead. Always keep things open for them to try new things. We want to maximize the amount of food choices they have. And the way to do that is, you know, 
give them as many options as possible and let them pick what they want to pick. Along with that, we're, we're going to provide uh, adaptive equipment and make some consistency adjustments, which we'll get to here. And the reason we're going to do this, tying back into the last one, of uh, adaptive equipment consistency adjustments is that somewhere between 33 to 40 percent of geriatric patients have difficulty eating. Whether this is um, whether it's due to cognitive impairment or physical impairment, it may be a feeding issue, like it's difficult for them to move the plate from the food to their mouth. Maybe it's a chewing problem. Maybe it's a swallowing problem. Maybe it's a you know, cognitive impairment from dementia. But the point is, almost half of them, somewhere between a third and a half, have difficulty eating by themselves. So we use adaptive equipment. The point of adaptive equipment is to give somebody the opportunity to eat by themselves as much as possible. And this is this is a very, very extreme example up here. But this is you know, a, a this is a high wall plate that's probably so that you can scoop food into the side of it and pick it up with your spoon or fork. It's probably weighted, it probably has non-slide bumpers or feet on the bottom. Their spoon there is curved to make it easier to lip, to bring to their mouth because it takes actually a lot of dexterity and agility to use a uh, fork or spoon. If you probably never thought of that, but it does. Uh, they have a strap to help them hold it on. They have a, it looks like they have some enhanced handles to make it easier to hold if they have a, like say, arthritis or Parkinson's or something like that. And the whole point of this is to let them eat by themselves. Let them feed themselves. Again, think how you would feel. How much do you like the idea of somebody spoon feeding you every meal every day? Not a lot. I'm, I'm willing to bet. And again, the literature does bear this out. Quality of life scores are far higher in those with higher independence. So remember first, we said earlier that food quality is the single most important point of care for quality of life. A very, very close second is independence. So we're improving their food, their eating experience, and their ability to eat by themselves. So last thing here is consistency. Um, this is probably, I have old model and we're going to new model. This will vary depending on where you are. Um, so the old model here, what we're talking about in consistency is the, um, consistency of the food or is it regular? Is it say mechanical soft? The traditional ones you'll see in places, the old model are regular mechanical soft and puree. Some people count finger foods in there. Some people will also, or some facilities will also have a, um, like a soft or bite-sized option, maybe both, kind of in between regular and mechanical soft. So this is how soft, how ground up food is, um, all the way to puree, which is kind of a mashed potato pudding-y consistency. And then the other hand is liquids, which are thin. They can go up to nectar, honey, and pudding in the old system. I've never actually seen anyone in pudding. I, I've mixed it a couple times out of curiosity to see how what it's like, but um, I've never had somebody on that. The new framework is ITSI. Uh, it began in, well, it says it was like formalized in 2019. It began earlier than that. And this is a joint collaboration of the Speech Language Pathology Association and the Academy. And uh, I don't feel like this, there's a scope and time in here to go over that, but know that the difference here is really that instead of looking at kind of comparing what the consistency of a food or drink item is, what this does is actually provides measurements for how to determine that you have made something soft and bite-sized level six. That That's the distinction between the two uh, programs. The last thing to discuss here very briefly is exercise. Now, obviously, as the dietitian, you're not going to be providing people with exercise prescriptions or coaching. What you can do, though, is again, that team approach, make sure that your residents are doing as much physical activity as they can reasonably do and comfortably do. 
So whether that's in a facility, you may have therapists, you probably have an exercise program, uh, make, again, encourage them to go. Uh, if you're in a congregate system, you probably have, again, an exercise program, or you, some of them are held in um, churches or schools, and they have access to other equipment. So maybe they can that a program can be begun that uses that, uh, or it can just be made available to the to the uh, patients, the clients. If you remember earlier, I mentioned that I find it frustrating when I'll see a doctor's order for a vitamin D supplement or a protein supplement and nothing else. Because doing protein by itself, consuming protein by itself, is not going to do anything. The human body is only going to do what's asked of it. So we need to provide it the raw materials and then ask more out of it. And that's what exercise does. It's asking more out of the body. So the real prescription here is proper nutrition, maybe some supplementation, and resistance therapy as they're able. Y'all, that is interventions. I'll catch you on the other one, unless you decide to go the other direction. When we're talking about uh, PES statements, nutrition care planning for elder adults, and we're about to wrap this up. I'll catch you in the next one. Have a good one. Bye.